can do that. I didn't know if he could fit the whole chapter on there, and as you see, he did really well because he fit the whole chapter and the first two verses of the other chapter. How many of you guys actually have read the book of Habakkuk? It's a small book. You know what the, uh, the context of the book is, what the setting is for it? Right? You read it? Remember, it's completely no. It's really important that you guys understand the setting and the context of the book. Habakkuk was a contemporary of Jeremiah. Jeremiah gave his prophecies warning the people that Judah was going to fall, that God was going to bring judgment upon them, and the judgment God was going to bring was going to come, to the, come in the form of the Babylonians. Okay? I don't have to go can you still hear me though? Yeah. Yeah. We need it for the recorder. Okay. How's that? Yeah. I need to, you need to turn it down. <laughs> right, like I said, uh, Habakkuk, Habakkuk was a contemporary of Jeremiah. Jeremiah warned the people to repent, to turn from their sins, or judgment was going to come. And the judgment was going to come in the form of the Babylonians. Now, you guys remember Daniel? Oh, yes. Where was Daniel at when he wrote his book of Daniel? So, Daniel was one of the captives that was taken away, right? Would you say Daniel was a good man? Was he a righteous man? Yes. Was he loved by God? Yes. Then, then, then why did he find himself in Babylon? Now I want you to think about this because this is the question that Habakkuk asks because he doesn't understand God's ways. The title of this message today is My Ways Are Not Your Ways. That's a quote from Scripture. When God speaks and He tells us that His thoughts are not like our thoughts and His ways are not like our ways. Now, you remember Daniel, right? He was an upright man, well-beloved by God. But you know that Daniel was made into a eunuch. Yeah. Most people don't even think about that. And I'll let your imaginations figure out how that happens. Okay? He wasn't born that way. Right. So you've got a man that's beloved by God, who is taken captive, finds himself in a foreign nation with foreign people, and... That happens to him. Don't you think you'd start wondering where your God was? But Daniel never lost his faith. Okay? Daniel understood that God is sovereign, and whatever God wants, that is what will happen. What you need to understand, and this is what's very hard for Christians in 2015 to realize, is that God allows bad things to happen to his people. When the judgments came upon Judah, did they only come upon the wicked in Judah? No. Daniel is a proof of that. Jeremiah is a proof of that. Habakkuk is a proof of that. When judgments come, they come upon all, good or bad. Now, this message that is given in Habakkuk is a contemporary message of what is going to happen in the last days. Does not God promise that he will bring an end to sin? Yes. And when he brings an end to sin, does he just like snap his fingers and everything is done? No. Please. Have you ever read the book of Revelation? Okay. Uh, I know a lot of people don't want to live through that time because it sounds scary. But what you have to understand is that God is in control. And another thing you need to understand is God's people who are righteous, outside of God, are they really righteous? No, no. So understand that God has the right to bring trouble and pain upon every person who lives on this planet. We cannot stand in front of Him and say, I don't deserve this. Amen. That's hard for us to accept and understand. Paul makes it plain in Romans, there is no one good, no, not one. Now, realize how much God loves you, because Paul also writes that while we were yet enemies, 
Christ died for us. Do you understand that it's better that God sees you and puts you in that class that we all have sinned and fallen short? Because if He puts you there, then the salvation that He gives is to all. And if you happen to be better than me, God is not going to love you more than me. You understand? <laughs> that in God's eyes, He leveled the playing field. We are all equal. There is no more Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. We are all one in Christ. That's good news. That is the good news of the gospel. But listen. In this world today, as in Habakkuk's world, there was evil and violence and sin, and they were wondering, how long will God allow it to go on? Habakkuk cried out, I cried to you about the violence, I cried to you about the wickedness, about the murder, and you do nothing. Do we not do the same today? Yes. We wonder, where is God at? Look in our day today, does it not seem that wickedness is triumphing over righteousness? Does it seem that the wicked are skating by without even having to pay for any of the sins they're committing? This message, and I'm glad that Donald picked this book, because I asked him, where do we go next? He said, look, I want to do something in the Old Testament, but it can't be too big, because it will take too long. So he said, well, Habakkuk. And I was looking through it, reading it, and it's like, this is good. This is very good, because again, it is a message for us today. Now, Donald, which is this from the New King James? New King or James. King James. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask you a question, and I want an honest answer. How many of you actually read more than one version of the Bible? Raise your hand. Good for you. I'm so glad. And the reason I'm glad is the King James is a beautiful Bible. But there are some portions of it where the language is very hard to understand. I mean, very hard to understand. And you can read it over 4, 5, 6, 12 times, and it's still hard to understand. So, a version that has more up-to-date English is easier to understand what is being read. Now, how many of you are familiar with the clear word Bible? That's right. What is it? Okay. It is a paraphrase. And now, how many of you ever use paraphrases? Am I the only one? Okay. Paraphrases are good for study. Okay. They're good because they help you to see things in a much clearer English. But they are a paraphrase. Marty, you said a commentary. Why did you say that? Because he has interjected Helen White's writings into it to make it clearer, such that it's not a Bible, it is a commentary. Listen, that's very important. Now, I love the clear word. I use it for study, but I don't use it for teaching. It says right inside the cover, not to be used from the pulpit. Okay. So, there are some things in there that help you to understand very clearly what is being said. But let's look at this. Who has a different version than the King James here this morning? What do you have? New King James. Okay. Anybody have the American Standard? Who does? Okay. Because I'm going to have you read some stuff as well. Verse 1 of Habakkuk says what? The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. What does that word burden mean? Uh, King James will tell you another word could be used is oracle. You know what oracle means? Another word for that is vision. Okay? Sometimes we look at that and it's the burden. If I have a burden that I need to speak with you about, that's one definition of that word. Okay? Habakkuk saw in vision. God's answer to the questions that he's going to raise, okay? So what I want you to understand is that if you take this book and you read it along with Jeremiah, Jeremiah has been telling the people that if you do not repent, 
Judgment is going to come. Judah is going to fall. Now you need to realize that with God's true prophets, there are also false prophets at the same time. And the false prophets had the ear of the king and the ear of the leaders. And the false prophets were prophesying peace and prosperity, that God would not destroy his own people. He loves them too much for his people. And Jeremiah said plainly, there is a nation that is going to come and they will have no mercy on you. Why do you want to be destroyed? Now listen, if you were Jeremiah and you were Habakkuk, don't you think you would wonder why God would send a pagan nation as his arm of justice? As his form of punishment? You're more righteous than they are. That's Habakkuk's questions here. God's ways are not our ways. What you got to understand is, does, and this is the foundation of this entire little book, but this is the, the foundation of everything that God does. Does God have the right to send the Chaldeans as his form of punishment? Does he have the right? Does he have the right to send them on his own people? Yes. Why? Because he is God and he's sovereign. But what you need to understand is that the people have gotten to the point where this is what is going to happen to them because of their own choices. God says plainly, I have no joy in the death of who? The wicked. The wicked. Okay. That is either the wicked that are pagans or the wicked who claim to be his people. There's no difference between the two. Right? Following me? Yes. Okay? What you need to understand is how contemporary this book is to our situation today. In the Christian world today, there are so many who claim Christ as their Savior but are going to be shocked on that day when he separates the sheep from the goats, the wheat from the tares. And they're thinking they're going to be on this line when actually they're going to be in that line. And they're going to say to him, did we not do all these things in your name? Meaning, we believed in you. We put our faith in you. What was the difference? The difference was is that they thought they knew Christ. But Christ says, depart from me because I never knew you. you. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, there are a lot of Christ made in the image of men. And you need to make sure that you're not following that type of Christ. Does that make sense to you guys? The worst fate of any human being that ever has lived will be to stand there thinking they're saved and they get to that judgment day to find out that they're lost. And all of your hopes and all of your dreams done. And you have the uh, Americans. Yeah, it's, it's, okay. I have several versions out here. Can you read verses 1 through 4? The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. O Jehovah, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? I cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. Stop. Isn't that, isn't that contemporary with what goes on today? Yeah. yeah. Right? How many of you lock your doors at night? <laughs> when you go to bed? How many of you lock your doors when you leave the house? Yeah. How many of you have guns in your house to protect you and your family. Why? Because violence, home invasions, drive-by shootings. This is just here in this little part of our state. Think 
of the nation and I think of the world. Violence is all over the place. And we cry out to God and we ask, how long will you not answer us? <laughs> Keep reading. Why dost thou show me inequity and look upon perverseness? For destruction and violence are before me, and there is strife and contention rising. <laughs> Therefore the law is slack, and justice doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore justice goeth forth perverted. Behold ye among nations, and look and wonder marvelously, for I am working a work in your days, which ye will not believe, though it be told you. He's going to work a work in your days, and they wouldn't believe it, even if they were told. Before we get to that part, I want you to see again how contemporary this message is. <laughs> He cries out because of the violence. He cries out to God because justice is perverted. The justice system, the courts, are not working. The wicked can buy their way out of trouble. The righteous, those who don't have the power or a voice, are being trampled upon. And the justice system that was set up to help them one stepping upon that. Is that not what's happening in our day? Yes. Do we not see in our news and in our papers people standing up against the abuses of the power of the justice system? If any of you have been involved with the justice system, then you know how easily it is if you have connections and if you have money to buy your way out of trouble. And if you don't have money and you don't have connections and you've done nothing wrong but yet you're in the system, how easy it is to be railroaded. Contemporary. Let me read this from the King James. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. Plundering and violence. Uh, two nights ago in Orlando, you had two home invasions in one night. Then I think the next night there was another home invasion. Okay? Plundering and violence. There is strife and contention arises. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? Therefore, the law is what? Think about this. The law, the law that we have today, do the police, are they actively engaged in stopping the crime before it happens? You call them after the fact. If there's a crime that's actually taking place right then, you hope they get there what? In time. The law is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Is that the way it is today? Sometimes you wonder if there's any righteous left for the wicked to surround. Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes again, will he find faith on the earth? Therefore, perverse judgment proceeds. I need to write this small. <laughs> Look among the nations and watch. Okay, now what I want you to understand is verses 1 through 4 is Habakkuk talking to God. Okay? And some of your Bibles will have this broken down. Okay? Verses 1 through 4, Habakkuk talking to God. Now we have God talking back to Habakkuk. Okay? What was Habakkuk's question to God? How long are you going to let this take place and do nothing? Let me ask you a question. Have you ever asked God that same question for things that are happening in your life? Yep. I have. More than once, unfortunately. More than a dozen times. Sometimes it's multiple times during the day. Is God just sitting there on his throne doing nothing? 
Or is he watching another channel? <laughs> you saying, turns you off and let's look at this world over here? It is very hard for us to continue to live by faith when we don't see God actively working in our lives or in our world. But the core part of this message was the rallying cry of the Reformation. And it was the theme of Paul's book to the Romans. Do you know what that was? The just shall live by their faith. And we're going to get to that later on. But what I want you to think about is why was that little verse put here in the book of Habakkuk? The just shall live by their faith. Why? Because the Babylonians are coming. Hold on to that thought. The Babylonians are coming. And you're going to be taken with them. And you're going to live in a strange land. And it's not going to be easy. And so if you want to stay just, you need to live by your faith. Now, Ricky, what were you going to say? Uh, it's the just shall live by his faith. Depending on where you read it at from either Habakkuk or Paul's writing. The original is his faith. Okay, so, and we'll get to that, like I said, as we continue on with chapter 2. This is God talking back to Habakkuk, giving him an answer. Don't you love it when God actually replies? He doesn't reply the way we would ever think. The only one that he ever had dialogue with that was more like how we have dialogue with, with Moses. You know what I'm saying? Uh, also Abraham. When Abraham, uh, when God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abraham is saying, Lord, if there's a hundred people there, would you still destroy it? And then, you know, he keeps going down because he knows Sodom and Gomorrah and he's wondering, I don't even know if I can get ten people there. You know what I'm saying? So God now answers the back and he goes, Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, even though I told it to you. What is the work that you would not believe? What's God going to do? God's going to bring the Chaldeans and the Babylonians and they're going to come and they're going to lay waste to their city. You need to understand that this was not easy or clean. This destruction to them would be like the end of the world. And to them it was the end of their world. Right? And yet this is God's answer. God's thoughts are not like ours and His ways are not like ours. But do you know God well enough to know that God is love? Amen. And that everything that God does is done out of love? Amen. This prophet, Jeremiah, Daniel, Noah, <coughs> Noah's family, Two by two. 
And you're going, well, you mean just in my area? <laughs> and God goes, no, I need to preserve the animals all over the <coughs> world. But God says, listen, it's not you. I will bring them to you. Right? Now, don't you think Noah had to have faith? Right? Faith. Now, he's building this boat, and nothing's happening. The sky is blue. The ground is still watered by the dew that comes up. It has never rained. There's never been lightning. There's never been a, 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 a rain cloud. Ever. But he's building this boat. Neighbors are looking at him going, I don't know about this guy. But yet, there comes a day when you start seeing these animals coming. And there's no one. He's leading them into the boat. Right? Now, don't you think you would have started thinking that something's going on here? Yeah, absolutely. Right? <laughs> something's going on. But listen, your scientists are telling you it has never rained. It cannot happen. It is impossible. Yeah, I've never seen animals march before either. <laughs> when pigs fly, right? <laughs> so listen. You're told that when God destroyed the world then, that there was a time of probation. How long did it take Noah to build this boat? A year? A year. So what was the purpose of taking 120 years to build this boat? Now, now think about this. Deborah, if, if, if I knew a piece of really juicy bad news and I told it to you, and you and I were both gossips, how long do you think it would take before I got around the whole church? Okay. So 120 years, this man is building a boat, and he's a nut. Don't you think that that news spread everywhere? What was the purpose of it? Because God is love. Amen. But God also has given you free will and freedom to choose. And God does not want you if you don't choose Him out of love. <laughs> Why doesn't He want you? It's not that He doesn't want you. He loves you. It's just that you made a choice not to want Him. Amen. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. And God loves you so much that He will give you what you <coughs> desire desire of your heart. And if your heart does not desire Him, He will be gracious enough to give you the desire of your heart. So the same thing is happening here. God sent prophet after prophet to warn the people to change their ways. Why did they not change their ways? Too hard-headed? Okay. I don't know the answer for I know that it scares me to think that God worked miracles and it did not change their hearts. God sent prophets that spoke directly for Him and it did not change their hearts. And if that doesn't change their hearts, what hope do we have today? Uh, Ellen White talks about how um, uh, the religious leaders told the people that God was too kind and that He would never destroy them. He would never do Allow that kind of stuff to happen. They had the uh -huh. temple, too. Yes. The temple was their big, oh no, this is not happening. It could not happen. The temple is here. God's presence is always with us. Don't you know the promises that the Bible says? And I'm sure they could repeat those promises. If the promises all say yeah. <laughs> Listen. God says, Look among the nations and watch and be utterly astounded for I will work and work in your days which you would not believe that it was told you. For indeed, I am raising up the who? Who are the Chaldeans? Those are the Babylonians. That would be the, the people that Nebuchadnezzar came from. Is he a good man? 
Nebuchadnezzar? Eternally in heaven. Is he a good man? Now think about it. Because there came a day when he made a statue and wanted everybody to bow down to that statue. And if you didn't bow down to that statue, what happened to you? You were thrown now. He's not a sweetheart, is he? Okay? Nebuchadnezzar. This is the kind of people that he came from. I'm raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation, which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwellings and places that are what? Can you read that verse from the, the version that you had? That would be number for wool six. Six. For wool, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation that marched through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. Now listen, I want you to think about this because this will help you to understand when you look at nations and leaders and governments in our day to day. Where is God in all this? Okay? Where, where is God when you have somebody like uh, that guy Kim over in North Korea? Okay. Where is God when you have ISIS marching through the Middle East? Who was it that gave the Chaldeans the power to raise up and to become as strong as they were? Now, that is a theological question that's been debated and will be debated until probably Jesus comes. But in the end, the Bible says that God is sovereign and God raises up nations and God tears them down. That's in the book of Daniel. And God used that to show that Nebuchadnezzar was an instrument of God. The Babylonians here are an instrument of God. Does that mean that they're a pure and righteous nation? That means God is sovereign and He can do what He wants, when He wants, with who He wants. We are not to tell him, nor can we judge what he does. Because this is the difference between angels that have never fallen, angels that have fallen, and us who are fallen. That is, God created the angelic host perfect, just like he created Adam and Eve, perfect. They were without sin. They had a sinless nature. They were not selfish. They did not look out for number one. They were others centered. What you have to understand is they were that way because that's the way their creator is. God is not a selfish God. God is not a tyrant. God is not wicked or mean. God is love. Amen. God doesn't love. God is love. He is the personification of what true love is. Everything he does is done from who and what he is. That is his very nature. He is love. Amen. That is the way angels were created and that is the way Adam and Eve was created and that's the way you and I are supposed to be. This is why Christ, when He comes into your heart, gives you a new nature and you become a new creation. Amen. Yeah. One that doesn't look after itself, but now one that is others-centered. Right? God is going to raise up these Chaldeans, not because they're righteous, not because they deserve it, but because God has a bigger plan than just invading Judah. Amen. And he is going to tell them that these terrible and dreadful people are going to be judged themselves. <laughs> that judgment will first come upon the house of God and then it will come upon them. Okay? And that their judgments will be even worse than the judgment that they placed upon Judah. So let me ask you a question. Did God bring the children of Israel back? Yes. And did He ever bring the Chaldeans back? Right? Know that your 
your sins will find you out. Okay, you cannot live in your wickedness and expect not to be punished for it. Amen. It may not happen, unfortunately, in your lifetime, but it will happen. And this is another difference between us and God. We are only able to see through mortality. We have a beginning and we will have an end. Right? Unless Jesus comes, we will have an end. And so we view our world and our lives from that perspective. A beginning and an end. God has no beginning and He has no end. He's able to see it all at once know everything, and work through all of your decisions, all of my decisions, and still work out this plan. Amen. That's where we'll stop today, is I want you to understand that God answers Habakkuk's question, and the answer is, you have to trust me. I don't have to explain this to you. That's not who I am. But you do have to trust me, because that's who you are. Amen. And either you live by your faith, or you don't. The choice is yours. Our closing hymn is hymn number 530.